Hello, everyone. Oh, we're setting it up still. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Stewart. I'm with the Rockport's uh, Center for the Arts, and this is the Rockport Studio Tour Live. Welcome for this amazing episode today. We have all of our artists here, and we are going to be featuring Stan Urban. So, Stan, how about you wave? All right. One more time. Wave one more time. I'm still getting go. used to it today. Ah. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for inviting us into your studio for a peek behind. Uh, what artists do? Oh, great. So you're going to be uh, working on uh, help helping us understand teapots a little bit more and all their personalities, huh? Sure. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Well, in in preparation, I did get my teapot out today. I've been put a post okay. a post on Facebook, and I have my cup of tea ready to go. So how about you walk on into the studio and we'll introduce everyone else. We'll catch up okay, with you in a moment. I'm leaving the meeting. All right. All right. He will be back with us in just a few minutes. While we get started and he gets set up in the studio, let's do our artist roll call. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Doc. Will you please uh, start introducing everybody? Yeah, sure. Well, let me unmute everybody real quick and then we can start going down the list there. All right. So to my right here, I have Robin Hazard. Hi, Robin. How you doing? What you got going on this week? I'm doing fine. I hope everybody's doing okay. I've been working on a really large canvas and I don't know if you'll be able to see some input on the Oh, good deal. That wow, looks so you've awesome. been working on a very large canvas as influenced by the piece you just showed. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Well, Great. thanks for doing that. And then next I have uh, Anita Diebel. Hi, Anita. How you doing? Hi, I'm great. How's everybody? I'm glad to be here. And I've been working on this painting that's behind me. I finally finished it. Let's see if I can bring it a little closer. Just right on. There we go. So uh, it's finished and I'll put it online pretty soon because we're also selling wares. So thank you. All right. Thank you. And next we have Kuvi. All right. How you doing, Kuvi? What you got going on? <laughs> well, I'm Mike, Michael Kuvi on. I have a, a clock I just finished Monday. It's uh, uh, made with a mesquite cookie and it's kind of embellished with uh, turquoises for the, for the numbers. Hey, Mike, wow. hey, Kuvi, could you explain Mike? what a cookie is? Well, a cookie is Because I don't just, think it's chocolate it's, chip. It's a slab of, of mesquite that's cut horizontally across the, the trunk. Very cool, to, very cool. As, as opposed to vertically. I don't know, can very you see cool. that? If, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. See the turquoise, that's very oh, great. We can, we can see you in green no, of the uh -huh. that, that better? <laughs> Right on. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's finished with uh, with uh, acrylic uh, with uh, uh, epoxy, and so it stays. It looks like glass on top of it, so that's why. It's yeah. Like that. So, and Coop, right did on. you get a few pieces uh, for sale in the gift shop? Yes, I do. I have plenty. Great. Of them. So you can pick yeah. up his wares right down to the number of clocks the there. Studio well, number for of the clocks are available. Right oh, on, right on. are available. Fantastic. Who's next? All right, next we have Diane Johnson. Hi, Diane. How you doing? What we got going on in your shop? <laughs> oh, well, I've just been working, working more. Now I'm working on a big piece of amber, the amber that I've set in sterling on pearls. Which I right. So uh, we're always good here. Um, there she is. Here and thanks for joining us. Well, hey, thank I you. have a question for you, uh, Diane. Yes. What kind of amber is that? Where's that from? Can you hold it up well, and have actually, it be stuck? Uh, well, actually, it is from Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, own our exact to Mexico regularly, and he is this one in Mexico City, and it's from Chiapas. And he, I made this in the back uh, accidentally, and so now you can see breaking up yeah oh, she's breaking up a okay. little bit so diane just hold that close up to the screen yep. just still and i'm going to repeat what you said so everyone knows okay. so yep. our director uh luis perone travels to mexico quite frequently and he's very proud of, of mexican amber and so this is mexican amber and he gets it down in mexico city and brings it back for diane for her to make this wonderful jewelry so if you can look it's a little bit more orange and yellow 
than Russian amber, which has a more orange right. tone. And you can also right. see she made a mistake in the silver in the back, she made a hole, but it actually turned out to be pretty cool. And now you can see through the amber in parts and silver on the others. So that is amazing, very beautiful. Thank That's you. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank Who do we have next? All right, next we have Elsa. Hi, Elsa, how you doing? We saw you last week. Yes, you did. I'm great. And um, I'd like to show you the finished uh, product from what I did last last week. Oh, wow. Oh, that, now oh, that is gorgeous. Yes. Yes. I definitely oh, see yeah. the family resemblance. Yes, that's right Anna. On. Yep. Definitely. Right on. Wonderful. Thank you. And you can see uh, Elsa's show from last week on our YouTube station if you missed it. Who's yep. next? Yes. All right. Next, we got Barbara. Barbara, how are you doing? Great. Great. It's good to see everybody again. I'm going to be on next week. And yesterday I started working on a, a painting. And, and so next week I'm going to probably cover it up and start over or add stuff to this. So I'm going to be talking about oil and cold wax and how you layer it on a painting. So wow. Gonna, oh, so you're just, you'll just be reusing the same canvas and starting over? Yeah, well, it's a, it's the beginning of a painting. So I'm either going to trash it or keep working on it. So maybe next, we'll find oh, out. that's excellent. It would be great to see what get into the artist process there. Yeah. You're yeah. gonna keep us all in suspense. We don't wanna know what's going on. <laughs> Is it trash or treasure? <laughs> that's yeah, right. Trash or treasure, we'll find out. <laughs> Thank you. All right, who's next? Uh, all right, next I got Terry. Um, I Biamonte. believe Biamonte. Yes. Okay. All right. Hi, Terry. Hi, Terry. Welcome. Hi, Terry. This is your first week on cast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, opened a treasure chest that I've been sitting on for a long time and have put out some sea glass that I've collected all over the place that's traveled many miles in the ocean and gently been taken from a shiny piece of glass to a beautiful piece, piece of sea glass uh, due to the wear and tear of the sand and um, some black coral and some red coral. And I what have- What are you doing with all that? I'm making jewelry. Woo! And so I've just kind of gotten started and I'm mixing it with, or doing some things with turquoise, with rhodochrosite. And so I had a little example, little prototypes going on. Nice. Uh, very pretty. Uh, very cool. Oh, I love the selection. Well, great. We look so forward. And uh, Terry Bayamonte is going to be at Anita Diebel's studio during the studio tour. So thank you so much. And hey, I have a question for you, Terry. Where do you find the C class? Well, you can find it, frankly, right here in Rockport. Um, it, it's, it's a little scarce, uh, but I have picked it up. Um, I, I scuba dive, so I go to a lot of places that are on the water, and um, I pick it up everywhere I go. The majority wow. I have is probably from Fiji, um, but, you know, sea glass is kind of just all over the place, depending on where the, the fortuitous moments were that somebody dumped glass into the sea. Wow, that's pretty cool. So that gives you all you folks who aren't around for Rockport or aren't in Rockport right now, when you come and visit, that's a little treasure. You can start to look. You may be able to find it. You may not. As she said, it's rare. So let's see. It's something to look forward to. Who's next, yep. Doc? Right on. Next, we got Juliana. How you doing, Juliana? How you doing? Oh, hi, everyone. I'm doing great. Um, oh, I'm you look tired. Are you been you you're in finals week, aren't you? Yes, and I've been doing house projects up in the attic all this morning. Oh my gosh! So yeah, what I was like want? a little a little flustered, but I'm good. I'm um it, besides that, I've been working on some quilt um sketches for some quilt designs that I'm um starting to do. So oh, I'm very cool. And very Juliana cool. is going to be at Diane Johnson's Silver Silo Studio. And she is, uh, she works with Diane quite frequently. She's a textile artist and a student at Tim UCC. Thanks for joining us. Thank who's next? Thank you. All right, who's next? We got Deborah. Hi, Deborah. how you doing? Let's unmute you. There yeah, you Deborah Cronister, are you there? Hi. She's outside. So she's been nursing a baby bird this week. You can see that there. Oh. So, uh being outside gives it the appropriate UV 
rays. So I'm hanging out outside with it as much as possible. But I did, I'm in the middle of this piece right here. It's part of my Love in the Baroque series. And this is a, um, a, a double set of, of the dolphin handles off La Salle's ship, La Belle. Oh, wow. Okay. So I have a mold of the handle from the dolphin, the dolphin handle from the cannon that's at Corpus Christi Museum of uh, Science and History. And by putting the two of them together, it just needs some more bling in order to be really over the top, you know? So okay. I'll be doing that. Maybe I'll show you the finished one next week. Right on. Oh, that right on. is so cool. And just some a couple of fun facts about Deborah Cronister. She, her habit with animals come, does not, it comes from experience. She used to work at the Texas Zoo in Victoria and she is also a professor at Victoria College. So she is, she too is in finals week and working through things. So thanks so much for joining us today. All right, who's next? Oh, I'm glad to be here. I wouldn't miss Stan's presentation for the world. He's a, he's a God among men. <laughs> Woo all right well moving along we got vivian vivian how you doing what do you got going on i unloaded my kiln this morning and this is one of my favorite pieces from the kiln this morning beautiful. And, oh my goodness uh, gorgeous it's a it's a new to me kiln that i just recently purchased and um, i'm kind of having fun with it fun now, uh, Vivian is a great ceramicist. You can see, follow her on Facebook at V Rose Pottery. She posts some great things. So who's next, Doc? All right, next we got Jean. Jean, how you doing? Tell I'm us what you got great. going on. Well, I'm working on the new building committee uh, for the board at the Rock Person for the Arts. Woohoo! so she's uh, in our future. <laughs> Right. Is that a, and Doc, what are you working on right now? Well, what I'm working on right now is uh, we'll get it out here. I've been taking these uh, little pet ashes and I'm rolling them up in these little pendants here. I don't know if you can see all the ashes in there, but I'm using gold and silver to fume inside these uh, little pendants. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, so I could give you some ashes from, say, one of my German shepherds and you yeah. could make some jewelry that I could carry them around with me. Yep, this is like a little pendant. You can put it on your chest and hang it out with your dog. Or um, I do orbs too, so little marbles and stuff like that. But that's pretty much what I've been doing. Very cool, wonderful. Well, great, Stan. We are ready. Are you ready? I'm. I'm ready. <laughs> wonderful. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spotlight, and we. And, be, and right before you get started, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Hold on. And thank our sponsors. Where is he? All right. Sorry. Hold on just one sec. I'm working on it. Here we go. So First Community Bank. First Community Bank is our presenting sponsor, and they have a great new ITM. It's an interactive teller machine outside of their bank. And that you can do anything and everything. You need to sing someone. So if you would, are adhering to social distancing, you can easily use our ITM for all your banking needs. And they are right down in downtown Rockport. So thank you so much, First Community Bank. We did the artist's roll call and we're about to go into Stan's studio. So Stan, take it away. Oh, we're- Got to unmute Stan there. Okay, we're good now. Okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome to my studio in downtown Rockport. Uh, this is it. It's a small space, only about 300 square feet, but I feel like that's pretty perfect for an individual uh, studio. Uh, it certainly is easier to clean up at the end of the day. Uh, and it's equipped with uh, uh, usual pieces of equipment. I have a couple of potter's wheels and a pug mill and a slab roller, clay extruder, um, uh, shelving for where that's in process and uh, good light actually north light coming in through this uh, these double doors so even though it's in the sort of back in the corner of a metal building it, it feels pretty nice I do have some uh, some uh, uh, good views 
Um, so we will begin by walking out into the other part of the metal building. And um, Vicki, my wife, and really she's uh, at least half of this operation. Uh, she's handling the camera. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge her for all the support I get. Uh, she helps me in so, so many ways. Um, and uh, so she's saying to <laughs> move on. So I think I will. Uh, this is an area where I do the glazing right now. I'm working on uh, assembling some lamps. Uh, some of you may recognize this uh, style here. That's a Diane Johnson uh, uh, lampshade. And uh, I find that this little work area with the workbench and uh, the tools and things that I have out here are really uh, uh, essential. I've never had that in such close proximity before to my um, uh, studio. Oh my gosh, who did, who did that lampshade? Diane Johnson did that. Oh, fantastic. Sorry, yeah. I was a little late. Uh, and I, be, I use this space also to build a lot of my uh, tools and equipment. There's hardly a day that goes by that I uh, don't find myself in the middle of the process where I need a little tool. It's usually something wooden and it needs to have the right shape, maybe a rib or a paddle or something of that sort. And so it's so convenient to just walk out here and have these tools uh, at hand. Uh, other things I've built, uh, this is a little prototype for a spray booth uh, that disassembles. Um, I made it that way. It's on a little projection cart and I keep all of my sprayers down here. Um, over here is a mixer that I use for uh, mixing uh, large quantities of glaze. I mix all my own glazes and um, you can just slip the bucket underneath and it'll mix them in pretty short order. Um, this is my electric kiln. And uh, it's a pretty average, not a huge one, but not small and everything goes into the bisque kiln uh, for the first firing. These are some little, uh, now there's not much in there right now. Uh, uh, these are some little prototype handles that uh, I've been making for coffee mugs. I will often bisque fire those and um, keep them nearby so that when I do make something, I can hold that up to it. Let's say if it's a cup, I can hold that up to it and get a sense of how that might look. Uh, it's not exact, but uh, I have a, a number of different lengths and sizes and widths of handles. I got and, a question uh, about that uh, kiln you got there. Is that a yeah. digital kiln or is it manual or yeah, what's, what's, it's, what's all up with that kiln? It, it is a digital kiln uh, since uh, I guess probably I've had digital kilns over the last four or five years. And uh, I wouldn't trade anything for that. I mean, it, it's so much more efficient and you it can is. program it to fire and you don't necessarily have to be around to turn up the switches every hour. Right on. So that is really very convenient. How hot so do you have to here, fire something? Well, for the, for the BIS firing, it's about 1800, uh, uh, between 18, 1900 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And that's just enough heat to half harden the clay so that it still remains absorbent uh, for purposes of glazing, uh, but uh, non-soluble. Uh, uh, non so that when you dip it in glaze or brush it or however you apply it, it won't dissolve, but it will uh, absorb. Um, and if you don't do that, then the wear is much more fragile. Okay, right on. Okay, I'm gonna, go out toward the gas kiln that I just built and uh, okay I don't think you can hear Vicki but uh, she just went around one way and I went the other and uh, just to give you a sense of our view out toward the water so this is a little patio area where we do a little entertaining. And what's going to be right there, Stan? 
Well, right here. Oh, oh behind yeah. you now. <laughs> right, right here out this way is square the art center. Yes, that is going to be Hopefully the be of our soon. new uh, art center building right next door. So Stan is going to be able to walk right on over and teach classes in the new classrooms. Right. So uh, this is the, the gas kill I built last summer. It's uh, uh, sort of a moderate size. It's not a huge kill by, uh, uh, by uh, kill standards, but uh, it's just about the right size. It's small enough that I can fill it without just a huge uh, amount of, uh, of uh, work. And the, uh, it fires evenly. There are no sort of hot spots. Having the hinge door is a real convenience. This is a, a Kia wool door. Uh, it's made out of spun fibers, uh, kale and fibers. So it's very lightweight, very insulating, and it forms a nice gasket against the face of the kiln. Hey, Stan, I have a So there are a lot of little, uh, yeah. Uh, my question for you is, um, what's the difference? Why do you have two kilns? Well, the electric kiln uh, can be used in low fire or high fire, but it's so much more convenient to uh, do the initial firing in the electric because it is programmable. Not that they don't make programmable gas kilns, but they're much more complicated and uh, troublesome. And um, uh, in the uh, electric kiln, it's just a matter of convenience. You know, basically you program it, you turn it on and it, it's done, it shuts itself off. But there are things you can't do in electric kiln that you can do in a gas, which, uh, has to do with regulating the atmosphere. Um, uh, uh, an electric kiln is either neutral or oxidizing, ample oxygen throughout the firing. In a gas kiln, you can regulate the, the amount of fuel going in, create an oxygen starved atmosphere, and that creates effects that you can only get in reduction. Okay, Stan, I have a question. This is Diane. Yeah. Settle it once and for all. Is it kill or kiln? Do you pronounce the N? Yeah, you, you pronounce the N, N if you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, uh, it's very, uh, it's kind of hard to pronounce it, but it is kiln. Okay. I've, I've had students refer to it as, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was building it, when I was building it, um, a woman came up and wanted to know uh, all about what I was building. And I went into some explanation uh, about it being a kiln. And uh, after all of that, she commented, well, how many dogs do you have? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not kennel and it's not kill. It's kiln. Kiln. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, this area out here we usually use for a kind of a sales table. Uh, things that I've had uh, for a long time that I'm ready to see uh, go at a reduced price. Or in some cases, there might be some sort of minor flaw. But uh, uh, I think this little butter dish is a good example. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful little, little butter dish. It works really well. But it's got a little place right there where the lid stuck to the to the uh, base, and uh, so it's not something you would necessarily notice. But um, that has to go on the on the uh, usually about half price shelf. Wow, I need to check that out because what you consider flaws, I consider character. Now, now this piece right here, I think this is a, a beautiful little cup. But you see, it has that little chip right there. But that's a, a, a wonderful little tea bowl. Um, so those kind of things are available. Uh, this is the gallery. And I'm proudest of this gallery because it's so useful to me to be able to walk over and, and be reminded of things that I've made, I've made and what things I want to develop further and how I might go about doing that. And I make so many different kinds of things 
that uh, sometimes I sort of forget what was working. And instead of stacking my work in boxes and putting them away until the next show, um, I can walk over and uh, uh, kind of uh, see something I've made and, and sometimes be re-inspired to do more hey, or be reminded of what I don't want to do. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple questions. They're both kind of related. Uh, Kimmy, our friend Kimmy asks, how often do you fire that big gas kiln up? And I'm guessing that's how she would say it. And then our friend yeah. Greg Ruder is, he also asks, is, is that an updraft, up, up draft gas kiln? No, it's a downdraft kiln, uh, which ah. means that the flames come in at the bottom, they're turned upward and accumulate at the top. And then the flue down at the bottom at the back creates a, um, once heat starts moving through the flue and up the chimney, it creates a suction. So the yep. flame is much longer in a downdraft kiln than in an updraft kiln. And temperatures are typically a little more even. Okay. So that's why frequently? I went with a downdraft. How frequently do you fire the kiln up? Well, uh, I'd say on, on an annual average, probably uh, uh, once a month. So the inventory turns over, um, um, you know, I add, add to it about once a month. And I've got a little bit of a backlog now because there's been, you know, we, uh, there, uh, every opportunity to exhibit has been canceled. Uh, uh, Greg Ruder and I have a show in uh, Beeville at Coastal Bend College that never happened. And it's still there. The work has been there for a, a month and a half. And uh, I think we're going to postpone the opening until um, the fall. So Stan, if someone isn't uh, prepared to travel or come to your gallery, ooh, we'll get back to that teapot in a minute. But uh, if someone is... Uh, wants to buy some of these pieces, can they give you a call or how do they reach out to you? Yeah, uh, a lot of the work is on my website though. We don't have that set up to make sales. Um, and I don't necessarily still have all of the pieces that are on the website, but you could just call me and we could make an arrangement uh, for an appointment to come to the gallery or we could do basically what Vicky's doing now uh, just slowly panning the, stu the gallery and uh, see if there's anything that you might be uh, interested in and then well, I, communicate from that point. Yeah, Vicky's pretty savvy with Zoom. I bet you all could do a Zoom oh, yeah. meeting too. So yeah. they now, by the way, this is the teapot that will be the giveaway today. Whoa, uh, so everyone stick around. You'll have a chance oh, yeah. to win a Stan Irvin original. Look at that. Can you get a little closer yeah. with that? A little closer. Okay, I'm going to put it. <laughs> there you go. It's yeah. kind of a, I don't know if you can tell, it's kind of a, a deep uh, purple matte glaze. Yeah. Uh, kind of a blue black. And how it's much beautiful. liquid does it hold? Well, I'm not sure. It's, it probably would hold 20 ounces, maybe. Okay. A couple of cups maybe. of tea. It's a nice yeah. size. It's a nice size uh, teapot. Right on. Okay, so we'll come back to the studio. Now, yeah. in preparation, here, here are a few more. This is another variation of that teapot where uh, the handle is, uh, or the lid is on the back rather than underneath the handle. And, uh, uh, and basically that, that works the same way. Stan, before, uh, we some of these. The, before we get into these teapots, I made a little mistake and I need to back up. I just need to pause just for one moment and go okay. to gallery, gallery view one more time and find our friend Terry Frizzell. Terry is also a new member to our cast. He is a woodworker. Terry, say hi. <laughs> Wait, he's, a, he's, he's, on, he's on mute. Let me unmute him real quick okay. here. It was Terry Frizzell. There you go. All right, you're unmuted. All right, you got me. Yeah, we got you. And we got you right on. I'm enjoying it. 
and people will be, and he will be able to you'll see his wares at Kubi studio when we're able to go uh, live and in person. But we'll catch up with him next week where we'll see some of his work, hopefully. Welcome, Terry. I am so sorry. We have two new Terry's this week. So <laughs> That's thank fine. You so thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, one more thing before we get started. I'm going to share our screen one more time. And I just want to thank another sponsor. We have Prosperity Bank. They are a huge supporter of the arts here in town. And we want to thank them for all of their support here and of the Rockport Studio Tour and the arts. So with that, we're going to go back to Terry. I mean, go back to Stan. And Stan, let's see what you've got going. OK, well, in preparation for this, uh, it had been a while since I, I'd made teapots, so I wanted to get uh, back into it. So I, I made a series of four. Um, you should be looking at them there now, and they vary. Um, and uh, they're they're all about the same uh, capacity. They all have a. Um, this one has a little bit smaller lid than uh, the others, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, so, and this one has a little texture in the back. A lot of my inspiration for these forms, um, I mean, there are a lot of different inspirations. Um, uh, nature is one, um, architecture is another. You'll see architectural elements in, in some of these. Um, and other types of uh, vessels like boats. I mean, this is a vessel, a boat is a vessel. And uh, so, um, you know, take this, for instance, you know, I kind of, even though you may look at that and not see any of those elements there, I see a, I see a, a, a main body, I see a bow, I see a um, sort of a, a helm, uh, even waves <laughs> in the side of the pot, and uh, maybe a little wake behind it. Uh, so those suggestions are there even though they're subtle um, and that is uh, part of it and I, and I think that's one thing that uh, since I've moved my studio uh, oh yeah well while we're on the studio uh, you'll see some sculptures up here now this is from when I taught uh, a figurative sculpture class at St. Edwards University I retired from teaching in 2014 and uh, those are just examples uh, that I did during my classes. Uh, I would always work along with the students. I would usually get to the problematic areas uh, right before they did. So uh, they could see how I would resolve uh, certain things. And I think that's always an important part of teaching is uh, working alongside the students. You have to be a little bit careful not to uh, make it look, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't want to steal their thunder when they're making, you don't want to compete with what the students are doing. You certainly don't want to do that. But uh, I think it can be real helpful to students to see how someone else might approach it uh, without putting too much emphasis on that. Hey, okay, so. You have so, another question yeah. from the audience. Mm -hmm. And this one's from Greg Ruder. He was wondering, do you mix your glazes? I do. Yeah, I formulate all my glazes. And uh, I may start with a glaze that uh, is uh, handed down from another potter. Uh, I still use a few of those glazes that uh, Ishmael Soto used and Ron Bowling. And uh, but I've modified them over the years because materials change and it requires it, you to uh, uh, to do certain alterations to the glazes sometimes. And sometimes you wanna use the base glaze for the qualities you get out of that, but alter your colors a little. And that requires a lot of testing. And I use that Insight Glaze program so that I can see my uh, uh, the chemical formulas of the glazes and uh, look at the, at a molecular level so that I can uh, access uh, the, the 
the elements that I need in order to make the glaze do what I want to do. But there's always uh, a lot of uh, uh, testing required. Hey, Stan, I love your apron. Oh yeah, Rockport Center for the Arts. Yeah, yeah nice. Stan, okay, I got a question for you, Stan. Yeah. What's the biggest piece that you've ever produced? Uh, well, I, I know when I was in undergraduate school and I was first introduced to the wheel and I was really getting into it, um, I challenged the other students in the class to, uh, I told them that I would throw as much clay as they could wedge. And this was, you know, one, one student talking to the other students and they wedged up a lot of clay. I think it was, uh, more than I weighed at the time, I'll say wow. that. And uh, it, it wouldn't, the, the piece I ended up with wouldn't fit into the kiln. And I'm sure my skills have improved considerably since then, but uh, it was probably not the most beautiful thing in the world. And then um, I think on my website, there's a picture of uh, throwing a, a bowl that uh, I think it was about so big in diameter. Right um, okay, so, um, but there, there are uh, tricks to that. You can, you know, there's a limit, I suppose, to how much clay you can throw in a single uh, uh, setting, but you can always add to, you know, you can throw a part and then add other parts to it and build it up in that way. And that's probably the most sensible way to do it. Okay, now um, I usually start with about three pounds of clay. Um, and uh, for, a, for a teapot, that would make a, a pretty large teapot, but I can always trim it back a little uh, toward the end. I'd rather have a little more clay than I need than not enough. So this is uh, wedging the clay, and uh, basically the idea here is to wedge it so that if there's any uh, variation in its consistency uh, that that becomes that is corrected it becomes very homogeneous there are any air pockets they're released you kind of see there this is kind of a small amount of clay to do a spiral wedge but it's kind of interesting to see how the clay sort of uh, gets compressed underneath your hands and then it leaks out the back just a little at a time and expands and opens up and allows the air to uh, uh, exit the clay and then it gets compressed again. So um, that technique is really, or that method of wedging uh, is really effective. And then it ends up in kind of a cone shape, which, and round. You make that look so easy. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Stan, Juliana's got a question for you. Let me unmute her so she can ask. Go ahead, Juliana. Hi, Stan. I have a question. Ah. Um, what kind of clay body are you using? It's a white stoneware that I get from Armadillo Clay and Supply. It's called um, Della White. But uh, a lot of this clay I've used and reused multiple times uh, because I re reconstituted, and reconstituted. And what made you choose clay as an artist? What, what drew you to it? Well, I think when I was in undergraduate school, I started out um, drawing and that's what my forte was when I first started out. I did a lot of drawing. And, uh, but when I took my first clay class and I saw someone throw on the wheel, uh, I knew I had to do that. And, so I got pretty involved in it. And uh, the department was just beginning to invest in potter's wheels. And I was pretty excited about that. So uh, it just seemed to fit my demeanor and personality. And um, Okay, now, uh, so that was a long time ago. And, and I think clay, you know, I don't wanna to get too in the weeds here, but but I think clay just offers so many possibilities. Um, it's kind of endless and uh, uh, it's spontaneous. And, um, and I like the idea of function, not that you have to use the, the wheel to, to uh, create, uh, 
create functional work, you can use the wheel to make sculpture as well. And I've done quite a bit of that. But uh, uh, I like balancing that challenge between utility and beauty. And I, I, I like the sort of the, the humbling nature of clay. Um, it seems very uh, like a very uh, human endeavor. Uh, it certainly has a lot of history. So there are a lot of things to like um, that go beyond just its tactile quality, but that's one of the most uh, important, I think. Now, getting back to what I'm doing here, I first started out centering the wheel, uh, centering the clay. Then uh, before raising that wall, I wanna make sure that that bottom is compressed in the right thickness, because I'm gonna pull a wire underneath to cut it off and uh, I don't want the wire to come through. And I don't want to leave excess amount, excessive amount of clay that would add to this vessel's weight. And then I'm just going to grab a little bit of that clay and bring it up. I'm not sure where this bat came from and why it's that off center. It doesn't really matter, but it might look a little crazy. I think it's one that maybe um, someone brought in the studio and left and it doesn't quite fit my wheel. Okay, so I'm gonna cut off a little bit of this down here that's a little hard to get to. Now the teapot I'm making is gonna be similar to that, this one right here. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna throw this uh, body right side up and then I'm gonna flip it over and squash it. So that's, that's the idea. Stan, is that a technical term, squash it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, so while we're over here on your examples, can you tell us the difference between those four? I cut you off I mean, to introduce. Oh, you're already back. Forget about it. <laughs> okay. All right. I use a lot of ribs uh, just for defining shapes. Most and potters what is do. Rib? Can you point that out? Well, they're, they're little uh, tools that uh, uh, usually have some kind of a curve in them. Uh, or some combination of straight uh, straight lines and curves and points. And, and you can use them uh, to spread the clay. You can use them to clean the surface like that does. Um, or you can, um, you know, there are all kinds of shapes that you can get if you've got a rib that has that particular curve in it, maybe the shoulder of a pot or uh, the, the neck of a pot. And then at this point, I'm gonna use this. This is a little bamboo rib, it's a found object. Actually, it's, uh, I got it at a reception dinner and they were serving little hors d'oeuvres on it. But being bamboo, it's really hard and durable. And I've had that for a number of years. And I ate a lot of uh, hors d'oeuvres that night to get the ones I have. Okay, so I'm gonna use that rib because it disperses the, the pressure a little more evenly. Now you can see this, that could easily be sort of a traditional bottle form. And a lot of the things that I make uh, kind of start out that way, but it's important to me that they go beyond that. But I do like well-defined forms. Now here I'm going to choke this in. A lot of uh, beginning potters will have difficulty doing that. Why do beginning potters have uh, problems doing well, that? It, it just takes a lot of practice to get um, to get it down. I mean, the real trick, to, I'm gonna close that off completely. 
and the real trick to doing that, uh, um, Deborah knows this, as many of you do, I'm sure, um, that you have to apply pressure everywhere. If you just apply pressure on opposite sides, the clay is just going to change it, uh, its direction and go where it wants to go. But if you apply pressure everywhere, including the top, then it has no recourse other than to go in. And you work in such unique farms. Do you work in a series that one kind of leads to the other? Yeah, that's what this series here is about. Um, you know, especially if I haven't made a particular form in a while, um, I may start where I left off, but then I will uh, uh, try to get that to evolve through a series. But working in series is, is crucial to me. And it's surprising. Sometimes you, you think things are getting better and, and then you look back and you realize, well, the first one I did was the best one. I don't know if you experienced that, Anita. Wait, so did you just make this a whole sphere and closed sphere so it's hollow on the inside? Yeah, so it's got air trapped. So at this point, this is a much stronger form than it was when it was open because it does have the air trapped and you can use that trapped air to your advantage. You'll see here in just a minute. But that's basically the body of this teapot. So I would want to watch the profile of this very carefully to make sure it's the curve Shannon, that this, I want. Mm -hmm. This is Barbara. At this point, about how thick is the clay? Well, uh, it's probably about a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, maybe a little, maybe a little bit more than that. But uh, after this stiffens up a little, I can put it back on the wheel and trim it a little bit if I feel like, you know, at this point, once it's removed from the wheel, you kind of got kind of got a sense of just how um, uh, heavy it is. And of course, weight is very crucial. So I don't want these things to end up uh, heavier than they should be for their size. We have another question and, from the audience, Stan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tina, I ask, uh, do you sketch your ideas for a series before you begin, or do you keep them all? Not, necessar your not necessarily. I do a lot of sketching, but uh, uh, a lot of times I will begin with uh, just by making and maybe putting pieces together rather hurriedly to get a clear sense of the direction I'm going. And then uh, once I get a little clearer about that, then I can spend a little more time um, uh, refining it. Okay, so now this is still fairly wet, but you can still trim a little. If is you this the same piece that you just did or is this another no, piece? This is, this is one I did yesterday that uh, I wanted to uh, get to this point so I can okay. do the next step. So, so I'm gonna step. actually be working on uh, three different teapots today because each one is in a slightly more advanced stage. And I figured I would probably be running out of time. So, and so anyway, now that didn't necessarily improve this, but, um, you get the idea. Now, you notice in the back of this one, there's kind of a sort of a wave pattern. So I'm gonna get that with a wiggle wire. Okay, so here's a, here's a wiggle wire. It's just a spring that's pulled out and a handle put on, on uh, each end. And I can take that and swipe it underneath the pot, take it off. Remember this one is still uh, pretty wet. So then I can set that down. Now there's pressure inside. So if I push too hard, too much, it's gonna bust. 
So I'm gonna let a little bit of the air out. I'll choose a place the spout will be along here. So um, I'm gonna put a little hole there. I can hear the air go. Psh. So then I'm then it'll go on down further. I love these little jowls that get formed here and the little bulge that occurs in the back and the little wavy, uh, it's almost like feathers. So um, that would be the body of this teapot. Now, at this point, it's still too wet to do any more too. Oh, but the other thing, I almost forgot, I've got to throw the other parts. So. Oh, I got a question for you, Stan. That teapot you, yeah. just, you just put on the deal, how long does it need to sit there before you can actually work it again? Well, in Rockport, maybe 24 hours because it's always humid in Rockport. Okay. But uh, I know in Austin, I could make things in the morning and uh, uh, assemble them in the afternoon. But that brings I, me to the question, Stan, about your work schedule. You know, when you're not all just shut in and you have a normal life, uh, what is your typical day like? Well, Deborah, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> you lucky I hear that. I like to, uh, a little caveat there. I'm retired from teaching. I'm very much uh, uh, working in the studio. Uh, pretty, yeah, can you hear Vicky? Vicky says every day. He gets retired then, every day. <laughs> but I, I do get, uh, you know, I do get tired. And so I will... Uh, Did we lose Stan? I think we did. Um, oh, can someone text, well, I, text him and let him know? Yeah, that we lost him. We'll get Might him right been. back, folks. We're all going to be reaching out to him right now about this. But he's been showing us such a great episode. I mean, this is a great episode. And talk about teapots and that giveaway. That is going to be amazing. So there could be yes, some lucky person in our audience that gets that today. So hopefully they'll be back here in just a moment. I, I can see they dropped off. I bet they're aware. Yeah. And give it a minute. So this is all live. So we're filling this in as you go. You get to really see what's happening. So uh, who's working on something? Hmm. Anyone? I see Anita back there. She's working on yeah, something. Yeah, Anita, can, I'm going to try to unmute you. You're going to have to unmute yourself. Anita, I got her. There you go, Anita. No, she's still muted. Oh, yep. there, there you go. go. There she goes. Well, as much as I love Stan's demos, and I've watched them before, Stan is a master. His work shows it, but he's also a teacher. And so if we don't get to continue today, please see one of his uh, his demos or stop by his yeah, studio. Yeah, of me, but I think that they'll be right back in just yes. a moment. I just spoke to her. Uh -huh. Oh, good. good. Vicky, where oh. that they're off and they're oh. trying to get back on. Oh, yeah. great. So everyone just stick with us for just yeah. a minute because you want that teapot. That teapot's amazing. Well, in the meantime, I have a hint for other watercolors. When your two watercolors dry up, you peel off the outside and save the little pigment that's inside. And these are quite expensive. So if you can repurpose them, it works. So I'm sitting here peeling paint out of dried up tubes. Oh, well, that, at least you're being economical and environmentally <laughs> friendly. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to paint and watch somebody. So uh, I always have something practical to do. But that's the beauty of watercolor. You can, even though it's dried up, you can reconstitute it because it's, it's water. <laughs> so so that, there we go. that makes it okay. fun. I think she's back. Yeah, okay. she's back. Wonderful. Well, so. I think that's our... our uh, our cell service at 
it gets yeah. interrupted every now and then. Okay, so this is the part that uh, uh, sits on top that uh, holds the lid. So I'm trying to make this uh, just the right uh, diameter. It's important that that be big enough so that you could get a tea bag in there or uh, uh, see down inside. I made this little tool here that uh, I didn't invent this, but I added some parts. Basically, um, this the width right here is two and a quarter inches from here to here. So I want this to fit down in there and be that width. You can tell the way it's stretching the edges of the cylinder that that cylinder is not quite wide enough. This will measure uh, the lid and I'll show you how that works later. But right now, I just wanna get this, the, that two and a quarter inch width. Okay, so if this fits in there, then that's about right. Now I'm kind of rushing this up, but uh, normally I, I'll take more time. So this is uh, the right diameter. So now I'm ready to cut that off. I'm gonna make two cuts there and pull the wire through. That bottom cut leaves that little ring on the bottom so that when it comes time to attach it, I can peel that ring off and I can handle it with the ring on there and not actually touch the, okay. the piece that I'm working with. Now the lid, I like to make, I don't know of anyone else who makes the lids quite like this, but I've gotten so used to doing it, it, uh, it seems to work really well. So I'm gonna start this lid by making a cylinder that would, fit inside that cylinder. That's kind of the starting point. I wanna make sure it's nice and thin so that uh, this whole addition doesn't add much weight to the teapot. Now, going back to this tool, this is the, the opening. These points are also two and a quarter inches apart. So I can fit that around and when this will fit around, then it will fit inside that opening. Does that make sense? Sure does. Okay. It does make sense, Stan, and I've always wondered how you got this perfect fit on your lid, no matter whether yeah. it's a big jar or a little thing, you always have a perfect fit. Yeah, so did you make I'll, that tool for all different measurements? Well, that's two of the measurements, but they're actually about three uh, or four on there. Okay, so I've got the shank, the part that fits down in there, the right diameter. Now I want to spread this out. I'm going to hold this part so it doesn't get any wider. And I'm going to spread that out. That's the part that rests on top so that it doesn't fall in. And then I'm going to close this off to form the lid. Now, once again, when I get this closed off, um, I'm gonna have air trapped inside. So at that point, it gets much stronger, less likely to collapse. And I can push that in, but just like the other piece, there's a point where it won't go in. You can push it in, it'll just pop back out because it's got pressure. So I'm gonna let a little pressure out so that I can continue to uh, define that knob. I'm gonna make it sit down just a little. Another part of this little tool um, this, this corner right here is rounded. So that I want to use, push that down just a little. I want this shank to be this tall. In other words, this part of the lid will drop down inside there. That distance, I think that's about an inch and a half so that the lid won't fall out when you tip the teapot. And I also want that tapered a little. And I want this little curve here to be on the under edge of that.
Okay, well, hopefully that will make sense. And then once again, I want to cut this and then cut it again down below that pad so that I can pull the wire through and lift that off. Okay, gosh, it's already five o'clock. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll run through this pretty quickly. Um, this is, this teapot is at uh, what I'm calling stage two. So, oh, and I didn't make the spout. You kind of see that the unique thing I do with spouts lately is in order to get that little curve, I completely close them off at the end. You can imagine after seeing that lid thrown, how that might be done. And with it closed off, it traps air. And so while it's still on the wheel and it's attached to that chunk of clay with the air trap, I can put that little arc in there without it folding and creasing. So um, this part will now be uh, cut off. That's the little pad. Uh, this will be put in place. I'll have to um, decide how to, I'm gonna place this on the opposite side of the teapot and decide where it goes forward or backward, up or down. And then I'm gonna come across the top of the pot and make a little dotted line and that's where, where I will make that cut. And then I'll begin assembling them. Now in the, the parts. Now this is the next we're, stage. We're doing great, Stan. If you could just slow down just a little bit so we can catch up. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah. well, that's good. Yeah, good don't enough. worry about that time. You're doing good. We, we can watch this all night. Yeah, yeah we, this uh, is amazing. Our, I don't want people to be leaving. <laughs> if, you, if you leave, don't tell no. me. We have a, a pretty solid 60 people watching right now, yeah. all yeah. eager for that teapot at the end. And frankly, they're all amazing yeah. comments. Yeah. Like you no make the coolest teapots and I can't believe how much planning goes into these teapots. Yeah. There's a okay. lot of so, so, so uh, now I made this spout and I don't normally do it quite this way, but for the purposes of this demo, um, I made that little little uh, uh, screen there or grill, and then I'll okay. put this on it, and you see things are beginning to come together. Now but this lid, the screen is for loose tea leaves, correct? To yeah, help straighten it out. Yeah, and I, I'll show you a little bit about how I do that. Um, but but basically, I'll do it on this one since y'all are giving me permission to not rush. Of course. I want to make sure that that spout is uh, on an axis, front to back axis. Uh, if it goes too low, then this, as you fill this up, the T will come out the spout. That's sort of a basic um, uh, tenet with making teapots. You got to have the spout up high enough so when the teapot is full, it, you've got a little room to tip it before the tea comes out. So, so let's say if that's where I want it, then I can put a little mark around here. And sometimes I'll use, I find a lot of use for these little, uh, uh, cookie cutters, not necessarily to cut anything, but you can see that cookie cutter is a little bit smaller than the base of that spout. So I think I'm going to go with the next smallest one. So if I push that in, I'm afraid it would uh, uh, collapse the teapot and it's still kind of soft. So I'm just gonna use the cookie cutter to make a mark. And then I'm gonna curve, I'm gonna angle this cut. 
What's the reason for the angle? So that when I put the holes in this and flip it around, this surface fits that surface. Okay, I gotcha. Ah, this is how you make the screen. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know of anybody that goes to trouble to do this. I, I, I know a lot of potters do make the little, little uh, series of openings. But uh, it's just something I, I like to do. I, don't, I can't say for sure that it makes it better uh, or it works, but I, you know, every potter has their theory about what is best and, and I kind of feel like it, it does make a difference. So then I'll take this piece of clay. Now this is the piece of clay that came off. So it's bas basically the same moisture level. And then I have this uh, little bisque pump mold that I press that around. Now, now I am rushing up here just a little bit because uh, I think people get get the point. And uh, and I, I usually offset that just a little so that the biggest part of the bulge will be more toward the front. And then this is just a little uh, piece of brass tubing that I use to make those holes. And the beauty of making it this way on the hump is that they're very clean. And so there's less likelihood that you're gonna have little crumbles of clay that, that might break off or something uh, or, or cause, uh, um, let, me, let me get one tool I have over here. Okay, so I can clear those out. So you get the idea there. I just make a series of holes. Now, this is one that I've already done. So this will then fit in there like that. I can even use this little mole after I score it, put slip. I can even use this and put a little pressure and twist it a little and get it really well seated. And then I'll take a knife and trim off this excess. So far, so good? Yeah, so far, so good. Cool. Really neat. So far, so amazing. <laughs> Thank you, now, our this perfectionist. Is a, this is a, a part that you don't see, but I know it's there. <laughs> well, and you make it look so easy and it's not. Well, I'm sure. I'm kind of scooting over the issues here a little, but but no, uh, you like you don't have any issues. <laughs> okay, so now I trim the back of this and score and slip that and attach attach this. Then I'll make my cut on the on the lid. And that can be a little bit tricky, but uh, I'm going to guess at it. Uh, let's say this is the front and this is the, the back 180 degrees around. And this is the high point on the front and it goes to a low point here. So I'm just going to rotate that and see if I can't sort of You know, pipe fitters use uh, templates they call saddles so that they can join two round pipes together that fit without a lot of um, extra repairs. Yeah. I need to use some of those. But anyway, so so that that's got that's pretty close. It's amazing to see, watch it come together. I can see I need to trim it off on the back just a little. And and choosing the right condition for the clay is so important. Like right now, this is a little soft. And if the clay is a little soft, then you're going to, it's going to end up looking a little bit messy from all the touching and uh, mark making on the, on the clay. So theoretically, ideally, I would, uh, um, I would let this stiffen up just a little bit. And that's the one, one good reason why you want to work in series 
so that when you reach that point where you really need to stop on one, you have another one to, to uh, go to and do whatever you need to do to it. And uh, you're not standing around watching paint dry or clay in this case. Uh, now this edge is a little rough and I noticed that it's a little bit, just a little snug. So, which frequently happens. Now y'all were asking about how you get lids to fit tight. Um, I have this little chuck. I make these when I'm making lidded forms so that they fit the kind of the shape and size form that I'm working on. And uh, so this is just right for these type little lids. I have a bit of an angle there and the clay is soft enough that if, you know, the next lid I do might be a little, uh, a little bigger or a little smaller so I can make it wider or I can make it smaller um, for a smaller lid and I want to get this angle right. And then the clay is just stiff enough that it will hold it. While I do a little trimming. Now, folks at home, this is uh, expert level uh, throwing. So trust <laughs> me, if you try to do this it, without experience, it will fall over. <laughs> yeah, but that's just the first time. Oh, that's just the first. You have to practice multiple. You get really times. good yeah. after a hundred, probably. Oh Maybe yeah. A thousand. <laughs> That Dilla White seems to handle a lot. I mean, it just visually, I see porcelain. Is it, uh, does it have much grog? I mean, it seems to have it, really good nice body. Yeah, and it has very, the actual clay now. Yeah, it has very little grog. Hmm. And grog it's, is, it's kind what, of a, what is it's, grog? It's the, well, grog is just clay that's been fired to a best temperature. It's, it's like kitty litter. As a matter of fact, kitty litter is grog. It's just clay that's uh, ground up and then fired. And uh, then it's put back into the clay, the plastic clay, for texture. And also it improves uh, some of the drying properties. Thanks for explaining that for our audience. Not everyone oh. is a ceramicist, so we just want to make sure that they're enjoying at home as well. And I, I, I think it's also a, a kind of beer, isn't it? Grog? I think that's what pirates drink. Right. Ooh. Okay, so, so that fits a little bit better. Wow. Okay, so now we can move on to the stage. What stage is this? Okay, we've got the grill, it's all cleaned up. This is trimmed. Um, we need a little uh, tooth scraper. I'm gonna scratch that a little bit. I don't usually use a lot of slip, mostly I use water, but what really determines whether or not it's best to use water or slip is uh, the condition of uh, the state of the drying. If it's pretty dry, um, I will use, uh, I will score, use water, or use slip, and put a lot of pressure. If it's... And for folks at uh, home, slip is just watered down clay, so it's very... Yeah, clay and liquid stay, yeah. So, it, so that's, that's what it's like. That's one of the fascinating things about clay. It has so many different stages, and if you learn to use those stages to your, to, to your benefit, uh, in other words, if you learn to do things at the right time, uh, it's very controllable. And yet it can be very humbling if you don't do that and try to um, make something that's real clean and when the clay is too soft, it won't sustain. Um, right on. Hey, Stan, uh, Vivian has a question for you. Let me unmute her real quick. Go ahead, Vivian. Stan, how long have you been throwing? How long have you been doing this? Could, you are making it look so easy. 
about an hour. Uh, no. <laughs> about an hour. Were you were you wanting to know the time? Was that the point of that question? Well, how long no. have you been teaching? How long have well, you been I, I started as a freshman in college, not even knowing what, I mean, I signed up for a course called uh, crafts. It's called crafts, believe it or not. And I was disappointed when I walked in and discovered, well, this is clay. I did that in high school and I hated it. But uh, within, you know, a first, uh, within a, I'd say a month, I was hooked. Oh, and that was in, uh, let me see. I need a calculator for this. That was in uh, 1960. I'll go with that. That so was about, yeah. About, yeah, that was probably um, 67. Right. Maybe, maybe 66. Uh, okay, so I attached that. I want, uh, I want to, or did I? Yeah, I did. Yes, you yeah, did. did it. Okay, so I want to make sure that gets sealed real well. I got the lid now. All it needs is a handle. So now sometimes I will, I mentioned earlier how I can make handles in advance and actually bisfire them and hold them up to the piece and sometimes I mean, obviously that one is too long and I have a limited amount of space here to work. So what I'm gonna to try to do is bring that handle out a little to get around the edge of the lid and turn it up and come down uh, a little, little bit like that one. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna dry this clay out a little. It's awfully wet and that's one, uh, thing that will get you in trouble with handles is if the clay is really wet, um, it just gets too sloppy too fast and then it won't support itself. So what is the tabletop made out of that allows you to dry out the clay? This is MDF, maximum density hardboard, and it's the best surface I've, um, uh, I can, I've ever used, um, you know, Canvas top tables are often uh, the choice, but a lot of dust gets trapped in um, under canvas. And then every time you try to clean them, it just creates a cloud. So uh, I like that whatever surface you, you use, it has to be absorbent. Hey, we have a question from Kathy Freeman in the audience. She asks, do you attach the spout directly across the pot from the handle? or do you offset it slightly? And if so, how many degrees? And is the offset to the left or right? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it's so offset, offset to the it. right. It's all offset to the, see it twist that way and throwing so it untwists. So I offset it to the right, eight degrees. <laughs> eight degrees? You get your protractor? I don't know. Well, it is, it, it is a good idea uh, because if you don't turn it a little to one side, when it dries, it will, it will have a memory. It'll go back toward the direction uh, from whence it came. And then uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a crooked spout. So, All right, Dan, yeah, we thanks. have about five more minutes left before we have to get to the giveaway. Okay. Well, I'm going to score this. I'm going to. Um, Oops, Vicki, we lost video. Oh, great. Good. Woo. Can you? Yeah, uh, we see you. Okay. Well, why don't you get to the, the giveaway and then come well, back to this? Perfect. All right, uh, everyone. Good. So we're going to get to the giveaway. And so I'm going to put, uh, hand it over to Doc. Doc, take it away. Talk about yeah. the giveaway. Right on, right on. So that giveaway was a little teapot we got going on. Um, and if you, our guys are not on YouTube, you can go to YouTube and subscribe. If you go down to the bottom right hand corner over here, you'll see a little red subscribe button. Subscribe, you'll get notified that when we go live that you can join these shows and you know, even for future if there are giveaways and stuff like that. Um, always give us the thumbs up. 
on the uh, on the video if you liked it. And uh, let me share my screen here, and we'll go to um, screen share, and then. All right, and we have about fifty six people in watching us right now. So let's go between one and seventy. One and seventy. All right, so we can so go. I'm typing here. right now in the chat, everyone. Type in your number between one and seventy. If one you and see seventy. Your number ten is not the number. Just to let you know, ten. That's is right. Ten is not the number. Not the number. Put in a number in our chat on YouTube between one and seventy. Okay, sounds good. Let me make make that max seventy, and that yeah, way uh, we're ready to go. Has a number in there. And you've typed it in, just type in a different one below it. Yep. 34 is you love Angel. You need to redo that one. Pick a new number. Kathy Freeman, you need to pick a new number. <laughs> Everybody's picking the same numbers. Yeah. Right oh, on. People are coming through. And it's too small. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just go to this one. So yeah, well, we've got quite a few. I, we have about 60 people watching. That's good. Good deal. We're going to give them one more minute. We're going to go off of your screen. Okay. Um, and I'm going to share mine for the okay. just a moment because we have one more sponsor to thank. We have Karen Mella. Get it noticed, get it sold. She's the sign sponsor for the Rockport Studio Tour. So when you come into town, we're going to be driving around. You're going to see her face and her logo all around, directing you to each of our wonderful studios. So I know that she sold Elsa her house and Elsa gave a wonderful testimonial last week. So I hope that you all check out Karen Mella. She is an amazing supporter of the arts. So we're in the middle. Also, I wanna let you all know uh, this week, we on Thursday, our uh, collage maker, Kelly Shaw, she's one of our wonderful members. She creates a multi-layered mixed media accordion on Thursday at 2 p.m. live on Facebook. And take what you learn there and while you're creating and put it on our Art With Me critique wall. So while you are following Kelly along, you're going to make something and then you're going to post that photo on Art With Me and just see what everyone has to say. And on Friday, Elena, our curator, will be hosting our happy hour with the artists. That's also on Facebook and it is live. So go to the Rockport Center for the Arts Facebook page and you can get reminders for each of these items. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. We're gonna go okay. back, Doc. Right on, right on. Take it away, let's find out. All right. Let's go to the random generator. I'll share it and there we go. I think we're up now. We got about quite a few numbers in there. All right, here we go. One, two, three, and lucky number is eight. Number eight, who's lucky number eight? I don't know, let's see. Or who's the closest? 12, because we're doing crisis, right? Allison Shush. Allison. Allison, Allison, you have won. You picked that lucky number eight. You are the first one. So right on. we will, Allison, if you just reach out to me at the Art Center, I will put you in contact with Stan and he will get you your teapot. So thank you so much, Allison. All right, let's take it. Let's get back to Stan. Okay. Oh, I did the... Uh... One second. Spotlight, there you go. Okay, so I pulled the handle, but it's a... Spotlight view yet? Oh, I'm working on it. All right, good All right. deal. And where is Stan? Ricky Totten. There. And there you go. Here there we you are. go. We're on. Right on. Okay, so I put the handle on. It's a little bit small. So I'll probably uh, uh, do another one, but I want to draw your attention to this spout. Um, I, I made that opening, remember that was closed off. So it's not gonna work as a teapot until you open it up. So I just took a pencil and pushed through and then made a little opening. And then I used this little, little wood tool here that has a ball on the end and it has a little bit of a curve in it. And I moistened it and put that in there. The thing I like about this tool is it'll give me that little right size opening. And that is the smallest part of the spout right at the end. So that should uh, uh, put the tea under a little bit of a pressure as it, it comes out and more likely to make a, uh, create a stream over into the cup rather than, um, rather than a splash. 
So there you go. Maybe we could end on some of these teapots. Yes, and, please. Uh, okay, and then uh, we'll call that we'll call that an end. Dan, you did an amazing job. Thank you and so Dan. much. We are all applauding you. You've done an. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Right on. Thanks so much. Amazing job. Yeah. So much. Yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. everybody's attendance. Well, you held our attention very well. So I just want to remind everyone that next week we will be back. We are going to be featuring uh, Barbara Sparkman. So Barbara is next week on May 19th. So and painting. So she'll be showing us how she works all around that. So thank you so much. I want to give a last shout out to our sponsors for the studio tour, including Tito's, Windway Gallery, Ace Hardware here, and Coastline Custom Homes in Rockport. When you come visit, make sure you check out the chamber or Rockport Fulton Chamber. Visit rockportfulton.com and check out what restaurants are open. We have a lot of restaurants and the chamber's doing a great job at making sure you know. You'll be able to come here, stop by some studios, head down to the Art Center, Estelle Star Gallery, pick up some work, because who, who here has artwork at the at the Estelle Star Gallery? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Juliana, I know you do. Yeah, what the yeah. Gouda. Yeah, there you go. Now everybody can raise their hand. We're on speaker our, view. <laughs> our amazing artist work. Thank you so much for joining us from me and all of our artists here in Rockport. Thanks Thank for you, watching. Dan. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Appreciate you. Thanks, everybody for joining. Thanks to Vicki. Thank you.